Genesis 25, verses 1 to 18. On page 19 in your Bibles. Abraham had taken another wife, whose name was Keturah. And she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. Dedan's sons were the Asherim, Letushim, and Lumim. And Midian's sons were Ephah, Ephur, Hanok, Abida, and Eldar. All these were sons of Keturah. Abraham gave everything he owned to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. And while he was still alive, he sent them eastward, away from his son Isaac, to the land of the east. This is the length of Abraham's life, 175 years. He took his last breath and died at a good old age, old and contented, and he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hethite. This was the field that Abraham bought from the Hethites. Abraham was buried there with his wife, Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son, Isaac, who lived near Beer Lahiru. These are the family records of Abraham's son, Ishmael, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's slave, bore to Abraham. These are the names of Ishmael's sons. Their names, according to the family records, are Nabaioth, Ishmael's firstborn, then Kedar, Adbeel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hadad, Tema, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedema. These are Ishmael's sons, and these are their names by their settlements and encampments, twelve leaders of their clans. This is the length of Ishmael's life, 137 years. He took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people. And they settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt as you go toward Asher. He stayed near all his relatives. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we've come to a sad but a wonderfully hopeful section of Genesis today. Our passage, as Bernard said, is centred around the death of the father of our faith, Abraham. But it's not marked by the grief and sadness that we normally associate with death and funerals, is it? And in part that's because our hero dies well, just as for at least the last 75 years he has lived well living and dying, full of faith and hope and contentment. Bookending his death are genealogies that attest to the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father that is just as real and relevant to us today. So let's pray and then we'll have a closer look. Heavenly Father, thank you that you show us uh, every day that you are faithful. I thank you that in your word is deep, uh, deep treasures of faithfulness that we can look at and we can actually live contentedly as well. Father, I pray that you would help each of us uh, today to listen to what you would have um, us hear, uh, that we might live lives that are contented because we know, uh, we know you and we know that you keep your promises to us. Amen. Well, as I said, we've come to the close of an amazing section in the book of Genesis. Starting back in chapter 11, we were introduced to Abram, who was one man called out by God to leave his father's pagan household and to go to a country that God would show him. He was born about 400 years after the flood, a few hundred years from the Tower of Babel in a time when it was extremely rare to find someone faithful to the Creator God. 
Even after the flood, the world was still submerged under the darkness of sin and death. But God had promised a saviour from the very beginning, hadn't he? Back in Genesis 3.15. Now the plan was set in motion by God by the calling of Abraham, or Abram at that stage, who was given this promise by God in Genesis chapter 12. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Well, throughout our study of Genesis over these last couple of years, we've followed Abram on his journey and saw in failures and in victories how God shaped him to be our ancestor of faith so that all that God promised would come through him eventually down to us today. This promise will span multiple generations over hundreds of years, testifying to the faithfulness and patience of God towards sinful man. And we've now come to the conclusion of the life of the father of our faith, Abraham. I'm at point one now. First, let us see more of Abraham's family. Now look at verses one and two. Abraham had taken another wife whose name was Keturah and she bore him sons. Not much is ever mentioned about these children or the circumstances of his third wife. What we are sure about is that Ishmael was his firstborn. Abraham had no other heir prior to that, and Isaac was born next. And he was named by God the true heir of Abraham. So these children must have been born later, but they are mentioned here, even if only briefly, because they show how God kept all of his promises to Abraham. Back in Genesis chapter 17, God told Abraham, your name will no longer be Abram, your name will be Abraham. For I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. Well, today, spiritually, Abraham is the father of many, many nations. But physically, this also came to pass for Abraham. You, I hope, will recognise in the list of names Midian, who was the father of the Midianites. They were the ones who bought Joseph from his brothers and sold him into slavery in Egypt. The wife of Moses was also a Midianite. In the book of Job, one of Job's friends is Bildad the Shuite, a descendant of Shua. And Jokshan fathered Sheba who I think we can assume to be the founder of the country or the region where the queen came from to visit Solomon in all his splendour. So you can see that already these sons of Abraham from his wife Keturah were also made into recognised nations. But what was it about Abraham that his sons became princes and kings? Well, nothing really, remember? He was just an ordinary man called out by God. No, this was all by the gracious, merciful providence of God. Look down at verses uh, 5 and 6 because they show us the legacies that Abraham left for all of his children. Abraham gave everything he owned to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and while he was still alive, he sent them eastward, away from his son Isaac, to the land of the east. It's usually up to the parents to decide how they want to pass down their inheritance. Sometimes God will decide to divide the inheritance between multiple children. But here you see the possession of the promised land, or at least the promise of it, because Abraham didn't own all the land yet. It was reserved solely for Isaac. All that Abraham owned was given to Isaac. Maybe his tents, his personal items, the field that he bought as a burial ground, and his herds and flocks. For the children of his concubines, he gave them gifts, perhaps of money, silver and gold, but he sent them off to the land of the east, away from Isaac, because he wanted to make sure that there was no dispute over the land of Canaan, no challenge to Isaac and his offspring's right to God's promises. He provided for them very well, but he sent them all away out of the land. 
Only Isaac remained in Canaan. Now there's two things to note here. The first is that sending to the east is a sign of judgment in the Old Testament. Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden to the east. Israel, both north and south, were sent to the east in the exile. Now I'm not saying that Abraham was making some kind of um, heavenly judgment on his other sons, but it's worth noting this pattern in God's providence. Secondly, Abraham was still living when he gave these gifts and these instructions. If Abraham had died before he sent them away, any of his sons, but especially Ishmael, could claim what was given to Isaac. But Abraham made his will known, he gave the gifts, and he had such authority that after his death there was no dispute. But another reason that there might not have been a dispute is because he might have satisfied the children very well with what he had given them. In Genesis 13 verse 2 we read that Abram was very rich in livestock, silver and gold. And that's quite early in his life's journey. He might have given each of them a large enough amount of wealth to be able to take care of themselves. Also notice that he gives gifts to the sons of his concubines. Concubines is plural and that refers both to Hagar and to Keturah. We saw in chapter 21 that Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael away with almost nothing. But now after the passing of several decades, he remembers Ishmael too and gave him gifts with the others. But I want you to notice that there is a difference between the two legacies that Abraham gives to Isaac and to all the other children. To the children of the concubines, he gives a legacy of gifts, of earthly gifts. To Isaac, as well as earthly gifts, he takes steps to ensure the legacy of the promised land. One legacy is temporary, the other is permanent, even as we look at it today, eternal. The other children receive a good gift, but only Isaac receives the promised land, the promises of it. Isaac is the sole heir of the promised land and none of his brothers have any right to it. The promised land will eventually belong to Isaac's descendants only. Isaac not only inherited the property, but he inherited the promises of God along with it. But now I'm at point two. Let's look at Abraham's personal legacy, his legacy of faith. Um, This legacy refers to how Abraham will be remembered. Uh, Look at verse 7. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Well, that in itself is amazing today, isn't it? But then again, who wants to live for 175 years? We also know that Abraham was called to this foreign land when he was about 75 years old. That means he's walked in faith for over 100 years. We've seen how hard his life was. Uh, It didn't get any easier when he left his father's house and started travelling. He was always a stranger in a foreign land. The locals kidnapped his nephew and he had to gather an army to save him. He witnessed the utter destruction of two sinful cities. You will remember he fell into fear twice and nearly put his wife and the very promise that God had made to him in great danger. He prayed for the righteous and for kings. God gave him very precious promises and pointed his eyes to the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. He was quick to obey God in both the circumcising of himself and his entire household and most notably, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, in the test of preparing to sacrifice his one and only son. And God had given him and Sarah that son in their very old age, hadn't he? but he did not see the fulfilment of all of God's promises. In reality, not many of of them at all. In his lifetime, he did not yet see his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky or as the sand on the seashore. When he died, he had eight children, and of those he considered his heirs, it was really only one child and one grandchild. They have not yet taken possession of the whole land of Canaan, 
In fact, not very much at all, just a field with a cave and some trees. 100 years living in or near the land that's promised to him and at the end of it, he only has a burial ground to his name. But he still believes in God's promise. He doesn't waver in his faith. The book of Hebrews says that he is among those who did not receive the things promised, but they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. It says that people like Abraham were still living by faith when they died. Which brings us to point three and to Abraham's death. Look at verse eight. He took his last breath and died at a good old age, old and contented. And he was gathered to his people. So here we have the death of Abraham. He died at a good old age, an old man full of years and content. What a blessing and what a testimony. Even without receiving the promises, but seeing all that God has done in his life, he trusted that God will eventually carry out all the promises, even the ones that he hadn't seen. And he was satisfied, he was content with his life. Will you be able to say that on your dying day? I pray that all who live by faith till the day they die can say that they have been satisfied with life, being thankful and content for all that God has done and is doing no matter how hard and even wrong it might seem at the time. And, of course, being hopeful for the even greater things that he will do. Can you say that now, today, in 2021? Are you satisfied with life? Are you content, thankful for all God has done and is currently doing in your life? How much more of God's goodness and faithfulness and promise-keeping do we get to see than Abraham ever did? We have even seen his only son crucified in our place, living the life we couldn't live and dying the death that we deserve. What reason do we have to despair or to be disappointed about how a life situation turns out or is currently working its way out. Now, I want to be as strong but as gentle as possible here because I know that in a group this size, there will be people here who are unwell. There are people who are fearful, people who are anxious about themselves, a family member or a friend, about COVID or maybe a difficult situation at school or work or just life in general. But if you aren't pouring the elixir of life from the promise of God's word into your heart, your mind, your soul, every day, then what is your hope in? Doctors, counsellors, lawyers, parts suppliers, weather forecasters, mouse baits, None of these can supply the hope that we all really need. The writer of Hebrews says that our hope in God is an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And Paul says in Romans 5, this hope will not disappoint us. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God's promises never claim that we won't suffer. God's promises never claim that we won't suffer. But he promises that we will never be evicted from his presence. The faith and hope that Abraham had were not in anything in this world, not even Lego, but solely in God and being in his presence. That is how you live well. That is how you be content in 2021. Verse 8 here is a fulfilment of God's promise in Genesis 15, 15. 
This is when God establishes his covenant with himself to give Abraham many descendants. God tells Abraham his descendants will be mistreated for 400 years in a country not their own, but will come out with great possessions. Then he tells Abraham, but you will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Once again, our faithful God fulfills the exact promise to Abraham decades later. Verse 8 also tells us that Abraham died and then was gathered to his people. Notice two distinct events. First, death, and then gathering. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us that there is life after death. There is more than this world. There is more than the eye can see. After our bodies expire here in this world, our souls will go to the next. But who are his people? Who are his ancestors? This phrase is used when Abraham died and Jacob and Moses and Aaron and David and once it's used of a whole generation that had served God faithfully. So to me it seems that his people are people of faith. His ancestors, Adam, Seth, Enoch, Noah, Shem, Eber, and many, many others. And we have this hope ourselves in Christ that one day too we can be gathered up to the faithful people like Abraham after we die. Abraham was 175 years old. This makes Isaac 75 and Ishmael is around 90. You remember that Ishmael was sent away when Isaac was a young boy. So they had spent about 70 years apart. We don't know how far apart, but they did live separately. But in a warm moment in this passage, here they are together, reconciled, maybe, maybe not. But they are together honour their fa- honouring their father by burying him. It's interesting to me at least that although Abraham had sent Ishmael away, effectively cutting him off with nothing, he still came back to pay respects to his father. So Isaac and Ishmael together buried Abraham in the cave that he had bought from the Hethites with his wife Sarah who died 38 years before he did. Abraham had bought this field in the promised land because he believed God's promise that it would become his descendants' land. Later Isaac and Jacob were buried here as well. And Joseph ensured his bones would be buried there as well, and they were when the Israelites came out of Egypt some 400 years later. This is what the writer to the Hebrews was getting at in today's reading. These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. But they now desire a better place a heavenly one. Um, Look now at verse 11. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who lived near Beer Lahiroi. This is the end of the account of Abraham that began back in chapter 11. It begins with the introduction of Abram as the son of Terah and ends with Isaac, the child of the promise, being blessed by God. It's important to note here that by this time, Jacob and Esau, the sons of Isaac, would have been about 15 years old. So Abraham lived to see Jacob, who would eventually become Israel, the father of the nation. The continuation of God's promise to roll back sin. This blessing is the continuation of the covenant that God made with Abraham, that his name will be great, that his descendants will be very numerous, and the whole world would be blessed through him. Although Abraham's time had come, God passed on the promise, the promises to the next generation and the generations to follow. Isaac was the immediate fulfilment of God's promise to Abraham and a sign of the fulfilment of all of God's other promises. I'm at point four now. Before the Genesis story continues... Um, regarding Isaac and the bloodline of our Saviour. There is a second bookend that further shows God's faithfulness to Abraham. Look at verse 12. 
These are the family records of Abraham's son Ishmael, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's slave, bore to Abraham. Remember when you see the words, these are the records, or this is the account, that it's a start of a new section in the book of Genesis. From here in verses 13 to 16, it gives the names of the 12 sons of Ishmael, who all became tribal rulers. This again was a direct answer to Abraham's prayer in chapter 17. When God made a promise to Abraham that Sarah will bear a child at the age of 90, Abraham laughed. He still wasn't quite the man of faith that he came to be in the following years. He wanted Ishmael to be the one. He said to God, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. Listen to what God says in in verse 20 of chapter 17. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. He will father 12 tribal leaders and I will make him into a great nation. God knew Abraham's heart. Ishmael may have only been his young teen years at the time, but here we see that God fulfilled his answer to Abraham's prayer exactly. It's no coincidence, is it? that Ishmael became the father of 12 rulers. Again, this is all orchestrated by God. Abraham had no part in it. In fact, he almost ended it when he sent Hagar and Ishmael away with just some food and a skin of water. But God, faithful as always, looked over the boy. Look at verse 17. This is the length of Ishmael's life, 137 years. He took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people. Ishmael lived a long life, though I'm not sure how much at peace he was. And when it says he was gathered to his people, I don't think that they are the same people that I talked about before with Abraham. God had prophesied to Hagar about Ishmael that he will be a wild donkey of a man and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. And this version has verse 18, he stayed near all his relatives. Many versions translate this as hostile to or in opposition with or made war against. It doesn't sound like a very happy 137 years. Ishmael and his descendants lived primarily south of the land of Canaan from east of Egypt, that's Saudi Arabia, all the way away to the Euphrates River in Babylon or southern Iraq today. And they travelled living in that area. God did fulfill his promise to Abraham. Ishmael was blessed and very fruitful and he became a great nation for the sake of Abraham and the promise that God made to him. Most important of all, God kept his promise to Abraham in that he became the ancestor of the one who would roll back the curse of sin and death, the saviour of the world, God's one and only son, Jesus Christ, who came through the line of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. (coughs) Through Christ, Abraham's offspring, the whole world is blessed with salvation from sin and death. Well, what is Abraham's legacy to us today? Obviously, it's not wealth, possessions or land. But it is a legacy of faith and hope, and if we trust in God, contentment. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, that great hall of faith passage Abraham is given two large sections. He believed in all the promises of God. His legacy to Isaac was the inheritance of the promised land. Spiritually, this teaches us that the children of the promise will inherit eternal life. Galatians 3.7 says, You know then that those who have faith, these are Abraham's sons. You are a child of this promise. You are a child of this promise if you have faith in Jesus as your saviour. But as great a man as Abraham was and as great as the legacy he has given to all the nations is, it would be very wrong of me to leave you thinking that it was all about him. What this passage tells us and what we have seen each week as we have looked at the life of Abraham is, is that it's all about God. God is the truly faithful one. He has taken Abram from obscurity and paganism, made him unbelievably wealthy in earthly terms, 
and every single promise he made to Abraham he has kept or has sown the seed in Abraham's lifetime for the fulfilment that we can see as we look back today. God is faithful. God is worthy of your trust. What he says he will do and he does not change. That is the real message from Abraham's life. The message that I want you to cling to as you navigate the ups and downs that life throws at you. As you confess that you are foreigners and temporary residents on the earth desiring a better place, a heavenly one. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us promises. Thank you for thousands of years of proving that you are a promise-keeping God. Father, help us to take tight hold of your promises. Uh, Whether things are going well or things are going poorly, help us to trust you, to be faithful to you as Abraham was, unwavering, We pray this for your glory and for Jesus' sake. Amen.